This week on Arizona Illustrated, a controversial fight. We'll go to bat for a snail the same way we go to bat for a jaguar because it's all of creation that we care about. The Hollywood Barber, a look back. It's not just somebody you're gonna take six, seven dollars away from him, you know, you gotta treat him special. And from far afield, Kate Meyer. Often our bodies become these vessels for harboring so many feelings that we can't distinguish. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. For the past three years, federal laws and policies aimed at protecting biological resources and the environment have been rolled back. Uh, many of those efforts have been challenged in court. This is our look inside the Tucson based Center for Biological Diversity, one of the most influential and controversial environmental groups pushing back against the Trump administration and how some of those fights are playing out in our region. Whenever there's a major project that could affect animals or the environment, chances are high that the Center for Biological Diversity is trying to stop it. To their supporters, they're helping save the planet. To their detractors, they're a wealthy, radical, anti-development group that manipulates the Endangered Species Act to stop resource development and human activity. Some of their battles are playing out in and around Arizona. They're against the proposed Rosemont Copper Mine, the villages at Vigneto Housing Development in Benson, and construction of a border wall. So we are just south of Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument. It's designated wilderness. That means Congress voted to designate this place with the highest degree of federal land protection possible. And we are watching the first panels of Trump's brand new border wall be installed here. The Trump administration has waived dozens of environmental laws to expedite border wall construction. Before this construction occurred, um, the vast majority of the border here was composed of vehicle barriers. These are really small, waist-high fences that stop vehicle traffic from crossing the border. They're completely permeable to wildlife. They allow Sonoran pronghorn or bighorn sheep to jump over or under. This wall right behind me, on the other hand, this will stop almost every terrestrial species in their tracks. This wall will fragment the best protected Sonoran Desert ecosystem on the planet in two. The truth is that hundreds of miles of wall are planned right now. And in large part, I think people haven't taken this threat seriously. And now, to our dismay, we're watching these walls be built. Now is the time for an outpouring of public opposition. First off, people need to realize that it's happening right now before our eyes. My name is Lakin Jordal. I'm the Borderlands campaigner with the Center for Biological Diversity. The Center for Biological Diversity started uh, 30 years ago. And at that time, I and three other friends met up in Arizona and New Mexico and bonded over our love and concern for endangered species. We were originally uh, out in reserve, New Mexico, very rural area, beautiful. As we became larger, we really needed to operate out of a significant city. We were ready to go really anywhere in the Southwest because we were working at that regional level. And we chose Tucson because it's just a great community for progressive politics. There were a lot of environmentalists already there. It was a really supportive community. And it's been our headquarters ever since. Amazingly, it's grown from four young volunteers to today, a staff of 180 scientists, lawyers, and activists, and, and media people. The unifying theme always is the extinction crisis, which is global, national, it's local, and saving species from extinction is the heart of, of everything we do. 
we don't prioritize one species over another. It's just how likely are we to win? How likely is it to actually make a difference on the ground for those species? How much will be protected? So we'll go to bat for a snail the same way we go to bat for a jaguar because it's all of creation that we care about. The center is probably best known for the amount of litigation we do. We do more environmental litigation than any other environmental group in the country. Since Donald Trump's inauguration, the Center for Biological Diversity has sued the federal government 173 times and counting. That's more than one lawsuit every week. Most of what's behind us here is national forest. It's Coronado National Forest, so it belongs to all of us uh, Americans. Uh, some of this land behind us belongs to Hud Bay Mining Company. There's about a thousand acres directly behind me here, which would be the area where the open pit itself would be. But uh, they are not able to do the mine without dumping their toxic waste on the national forest. And we're working very hard to prevent them from doing that. Supporters of the Rosemont Copper Mine say it'll bring much needed jobs and cash to the region. The center joined other environmental groups and tribes in lawsuits to block construction. In July 2019, a federal judge sided with opponents of the mine, saying Hud Bay Minerals lacks valid mining claims on the public lands where it plans to dump tailings. They will almost certainly appeal this ruling to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, but it may be a year and a half before the Ninth Circuit has a chance to look at it. So uh, in the meantime, they cannot move forward. They do not have valid permit to mine here. The Center for Biological Diversity's fights against projects like the Rosemont Copper Mine have attracted controversy, as have some of the group's tactics. And the Center for Biological Diversity uh, is fierce. I think that's the word. We fight like jaguars. We fight like badgers. We, we see this as an emergency. Well, you know, the center has been called confrontational. I, I don't know if that's exactly right, but we're, we're certainly aggressive. We're not afraid of controversy because we're here to change the status quo. The status quo is unsustainable. It's untenable. It's causing mass extinction of species. And you can't change the status quo without controversy. And so if you're not making waves, if corporations and congressmen are not mad at you, it's probably because you're not getting much done. I'm Sue Chilton. We live here in Arivaca, Arizona, and this is my husband, Jim. Jim Chilton, been married for 56 years, and I learned how to say yes, dear, a long time ago. He's quite good at it. <laughs> the Chiltons run a 50,000-acre cattle ranch in southern Arizona. The vast majority of their ranch is leased public land. 150 hippies from New York moved out here, and they celebrated every May Day here. They were good people. I enjoyed them. On one May Day, over 500 people were camped here and danced here and partied here. They have a real good time. A member of the Center for Biological Diversity camped right over behind that stump there. And uh, he camped and partied and had a good time, I hope. But seven to 10 days later, he came by and he took a photograph of two cows laying there on then the pulverized ground. And the caption underneath the photograph, Ruby pasture 100% utilized. And it was really due to the, the big party and the Center for Biological Diversity demanded that my grazing permit with the Forest Service be taken away. The Chilton sued the center for defamation and after several years were awarded $600,000 in damages. They've remained outspoken critics of the Center for Biological Diversity in the years since. 
They want to stop everything, stop growth, stop employment, stop uh, people living on the land. They use whatever species happens to be convenient. They uh, work to get it listed as endangered and to get habitat designed for it and uh, limit all activity on that habitat. And they're saving the country, saving all these species. And me, I believe in development. Jim Chilton's on the board of the recently founded Southwestern Communities Coalition, a group that's advocating for the villages at Vigneto, a large housing development outside of Benson, Arizona. The Center for Biological Diversity has sued to stop it. In Cochise County, the population is decreasing and with planned development in just 12,000 acres out of the million, uh, you need to have places where people can live and they create jobs. They create jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, you know, there's good economic development and there's bad economic development. So if economic development means that we have to sacrifice the integrity of our water supply and the, the quantity that ins ensures our water security in the future, uh, no, we're going to fight that. Everything we do to make the forest healthier, make them better places for humans to go to, when we file suit and stop air pollution, the air is easier to breathe for humans. You know, I, I believe that our whole mission makes life better for people by making it better for plants and animals and wild places. I see myself on a level with all these species, you know, like we're all in it together, you know, we're all in this together. And if the bees and the frogs and the jaguars start winking out, it makes me nervous. You know, scientists say that, you know, about 50% of the species on the entire planet could go extinct in the next century. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm a species on this planet and I would prefer to have better than 50-50 odds. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we should be fighting this fight uh, for our kids and our grandkids, not only so they can grow up in a world that's still alive, but so that they themselves have a world that's livable. We are at Quito Baquito Springs, um, and we're also just a stone's throw away from the international border. About 150 feet in that direction is the border, um, where new border wall construction is planned. It's this beautiful pond with surface water, which is miraculous in the Sonoran Desert. I mean, we're in one of the hottest and driest places in all of Arizona, and yet we have this lush desert oasis. And as a result, we also have two endangered species that call this spring home, um, the Quito Baquito pupfish and the Sonoita mud turtle. Neither of those species live anywhere else in this country. So if we damage this spring um, as a result of border wall construction, that will mean extinction for both of those species. Prior to working with the center, um, I actually worked here at Oregon Pipe with the National Park Service. I left the National Park Service shortly after Trump was elected and inaugurated. Everyone was very, very nervous to, to examine any of the impacts of border militarization or the border wall. Folks were extremely hesitant to talk about climate change. So it felt like a critical time to step out of, of, of a government agency and, and, and work in a way where I could play a more active advocacy role, calling alarm, drawing attention to these really significant issues that threaten life in the Sonoran Desert. Border wall construction has now begun about eight miles from Quito Baquito Springs. In centuries past, um, humans did a lot of damage because they didn't really have the science to know any better. You know, uh, we didn't know, you know, how deadly and toxic some of these materials are. We didn't know that there was not an endless supply of water, you know. Uh, you know, we didn't really know these things, but now we have the science. and We know better. There's no excuse for humans to drive ex species extinct anymore. I mean, we, we can coexist with species. All we have to do is come up with the political will to make it happen. 
people often ask me, like, you know, how do you keep enough hope to do this work when you look around and you see the destruction going on around us? And, yeah, and for me, that question gets everything backwards because it's doing the conservation work that makes me hopeful. It's not hope that makes me do the conservation work. The best solace is activism. And if you feel bad, if you feel depressed, get up, do something, take an action. You're gonna feel better, you're gonna feel energized, and it's what the world needs. And that's been pretty much our motto from, from day one. And now from our Far Afield series, this is Kate Meyer with Our Bodies Become These Vessels, a live collaborative painting and performance piece about the long lasting impact of intimate partner violence and trauma. Often our bodies become these vessels for harboring so many feelings that we can't distinguish. Which ones are which or what for? Tingling, masking our guilt and shame for not keeping them safe. Numb when the pain and the panic set in. Restless and tired all at once. with aches and anxiety, deep in that hole in the pit of our stomachs and the depths of our chest. And we hate them, these bodies that trigger and trap us inside. These bodies that feel nothing and everything all at once. These cracked shells that are supposed to protect us but can't do their jobs of fighting when it's time to fight, of fleeing when it's time to flee. And we hold it all inside and it eats away, like an acid bath that washes over and cleans us out till we are nothing but a hollow. And you can hear the wind whistle through because we become these vessels for harboring these feelings that are mirrored and re-experienced over and over on the flesh and on the skin and in the bones because our bodies become these vessels. To see more of Kate Meyer's performance art, you can visit our website at azpm.org and search for our story, A Safe Place. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share stories from this and previous episodes. And like us on Facebook, where you can watch stories, comment, and share your own story ideas. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram, where we share photos and links about the show and what's happening in our community. In the summer of 2015, we told you the story of Tucson barber, teacher, mentor, and business owner, Ray Compass. The award-winning and much revered owner of Hollywood Barber College passed away recently. We wanted to share his story with you again. This is the Hollywood Barber. He wants this place to look nice. Everybody has a chore, so get your chores done. He's always watching. He sees everything. He's always telling us, stand up straight. You know, don't slouch. 
look professional. And, uh, I feel like I'm privileged to, to learn from someone that good. And uh, he started just when he was young as me, so hopefully I'll end up just like him. Ray, I mean, he's, he's old school. He's done it for 50 plus years. I believe Ray knows everything. <laughs> Let's say you, you walk in and into the shop. I, I'm not looking at your shoes and I'm not looking at your clothes. I'm looking at your hair. Picture the haircut and that. I tell them we're not selling clothes, we're not selling shoes. You know, we're selling haircuts. My name is Ray Compass and I'm the owner of Hollywood Barber College. Remember the light spot is your guide, okay? I'll be 81 next month. Start a little lower than then, okay? I've been the teacher, you know, for quite a while. I don't know, something like 22 years now, I guess. Put this comb in, in this corner here. Oh, I've learned everything from Ray. Very good, very good. Just watching his techniques. My name is Kara Denius, and I am an instructor here at Hollywood Barber College. Just the straight razor, you need to make sure that the, you're not pushing no, too no, hard no. down. Just, no. yeah. As a student, I loved it. That's why I, I came back. I consider him family. He's, he's an extraordinary barber. I've learned so much. I learned still so much. You're more susceptible to chopping it off, so nice and easy. Anytime you watch, you can pick up something new and different that he might do that maybe he might not say. So you just kind of watch the detail. I, I think that's exciting. At your eyes, show you the, the darkness, the shadows, you know, the shadows, you know, make a good haircut. If you take it by the ear, that's what. My folks want me to go to college. They couldn't afford it, you know. So I seen the ad in the paper, Tucson Barber College. My group was the second group of graduating from there, so. That's how I got into barbering. I work at night and came to school in the daytime. Way back, you know, 53, 1953, you know, I started. I was at a shop called Maestro's. Good and the Italian guy. He got me, he offered me a job while I was in barber college, see? He, he taught me a lot of just how to Take care of customers, you know. Yeah, that's where you put next part. Yeah, but you're gonna grab it this way. It's not just somebody you're gonna take it six, seven dollars away from him, you know. You gotta treat him special. Nice. Thank you, Ray. They come in and they tell me I got a birthday. Well, it don't cost you nothing. It's happy birthday, you know. Thank you, you're doing good. When it comes to barbering, there's always someone watching, whether it be the guy cutting next to you, the guy being cut next to you. You never know who's going to walk in through that door, and you should always treat everybody the same. La niña. Muy bien, gracias. I grew up at the Water Hollywood, and uh, we opened a shop there. At that time, I was married, and my wife said, what are we going to name it? If you're at the Water Hollywood, I said, so we'll name it Hollywood. And that's how the name stuck. It's a, at that time, it's, everybody got a shave on your way to work. So it was always the first, same customers every morning. There was more to being a barber. There was more in the industry. There was always something new that would come up, and uh, I wanted to learn it. See, and I kept learning as much as I could to where I just about could do anything with hair. So when you're gonna do that, you gotta really take it up. This year I'm getting an award for the state championship, Arizona. Here's another one, state championship from Phoenix, Arizona, California championship. The California Southern Division state championship, and we won all six trophies. It got to be a habit. Wherever there was a show, competition, I wanted to go. This is me, this is Ralph. Ralph passed away, Angel worked here in town. Max uh, worked too. I won something like 60, 66 awards. 
second in the United States, lost by two points for being a United States champion. All done with the razor, no shears, no clippers, just razor cut. It's an art. You know, it's like an artist doing a, a nice painting. It's just a great experience. That's one of the reasons I came here, because of how, what Hollywood's known for, what Ray's known for. He said that even when he was um, barbering for, for decades, he would still take these master courses and always learning. I hope to be cutting as long as Ray. <laughs> um, you know, the more you cut, the more experience, the better you get throughout the years, you know. My mom and my aunts, they all are barbers. They all came here eight years or more ago. Everyone has their own style, and you get to make people look good and be happy with how they look. There we all right. are. I've tried to teach them to be respectful. Take you over to the front? Yep. Customers like to be taken care of by professionals. And I've had students that I've had to say, I can't teach you. You're, you're set in your ways, and that's the way it is. You know, nobody here can help you. I want them to be the best, you know, at what they do. Happy, have a nice family. I, I said to myself one day, I like to rent a big place, and have a big reunion, you know. I don't think I, there's a big enough place to have a reunion. Sometimes I'll stop by at their shop, say hi. Makes me feel good that they are successful. I love them all. I say they're all my kids. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week. <laughs>